Yeah, good evening. Hello, everyone. Uh, a warm welcome again to another D-Day event. Amazing that you all found your way here. And um, yeah, my name is Andrea Bauer. This is Boris Moschkowitz. We are the initiators of D-Day. And uh, tonight's topic is Every Bit Counts, how digital activism is changing the world. As we think a very current topic, since uh, as the third millennium unfolds, uh, we witness one of the biggest technical revolutions in history. And uh, digital media not just changes the way we communicate or the way we work, but also the way we organize our social life. And uh, suddenly we, we uh, witness also people who use digital tools to create projects, to create strategies uh, to foster this social change. And um, today, theoretically, everyone can, um, can start a social project, can fund a pro social project, or inform on social ills and start a movement. So tonight we want to dive a bit more into this topic and uh, ask how uh, digital innovation can drive this social change and how these digital efforts can be translated into the real life. And therefore, again, we have two amazing panelists, uh, which Boris will introduce. Indeed, with uh, Geraldine de Bastion and Raoul Krauthausen, we have two amazing speakers tonight whose uh, expertise and insights are built on many years of uh, grassroots campaigning and uh, digital activism. Geraldine has been on the forefront of uh, civil empowerment and enablement with her work at several NGOs and international projects. And as a curator of Republica and a filmmaker in Africa, whatever she chooses, she's always a unique way of uh, finding ways to influence uh, the political agenda. With, with Raul, he's uh, somebody who in his early 20s already started his first NGO and since then um, has been dedicated in uh, influencing and uh, challenging um, people in society. And with Sozialhelden, he created a platform for furthering the discourse and bringing like-minded people together. Um, and I think his brilliant understanding of digital innovation and also the use of crowdsourcing, he was one of the pioneers in digital activism in Germany and probably also internationally. So. Uh, we're very happy uh, to have both of you here. Um, also, Raul was awarded last year, two years ago, the uh, Bundesverdienstkreuz, so the uh, Federal Cross of Merit on a Ribbon. Um, it, it just shows that there is appreciation for the work that the two have been doing, and I think both of you are catalysts for uh, the digital scene, for the NGO environment and landscape in Europe, and uh, I think both of, us, uh, both of them will give us more clues on how every one of us can influence and uh, be part of a social change on an everyday basis. So welcome Geraldine de Bastion and Raoul Krauthausen. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks that you're here. Uh, we are very honored and um, yeah, my first question goes to you, Geraldine. You are active in so many areas. You work with, uh, as a consultant with new thinking as an event curator with Republika and also as an activist with Digitale Gesellschaft. And um, I was wondering what your favorite tech-related projects were and uh, wh which, which really made a social impact in the last years because you have a great overview, I guess. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much uh, for inviting me here tonight. It's uh, really flattering the wonderful words of introduction. I'm also super happy to be on a panel with Raul today. Um, yeah, um, I guess I guess I choose an example that um, comes from far away. Um, just to start with, I know we're going to venture into different corners of the world um, when it comes to digital activism throughout the night tonight. And I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the platform Ushahidi. For me, that is still one of the examples of a really powerful platform, a tool that was created to. Yeah, to foster social change, A, because it's an, well, first of all, hands up. I just want to make sure everybody's heard of it before. Oh, wow. OK, great. <laughs> In that case, um, I'll start somewhere else. Um, I'm always, uh, I speak a lot about different kinds of examples of innovation, digital innovation coming from Africa. And, and I get so used to talking about it that I always assume, like, 
a couple of those examples Everyone everybody's knows. heard about. So um, Ushahidi is a crowd mapping tool that was created after violence broke out in Kenya following the national elections in 2007, 2008. And it was created by the very vibrant blogger community at that time because there was a media blackout, there was a lot of chaos in the country, and they thought, what can they possibly do to create more oversight in this situation and give people back a bit of power and confidence? And so they created a mesh up tool between um, Google Maps and a tool called Frontline SMS that allows you to uh, input information both via the net but also via SMS shortcode. And by that, they started mapping all the incidences of violence and um, encouraging citizens to be good examples with nonviolent behavior. And they started this as an open source platform. And after that, Ushahidi now has grown into a portal that's. Um, yeah, it en enables people to host their own crowd maps around the world. It's been used, I would say, in countries across the globe. In most cases of humanitarian disaster, it's one of the main tools that's used today. So for instance, after the um, tsunami and devastation in Japan, it was used. It was used after the earthquake hit um, Haiti by all the um, official help organizations to identify victims. And it's been also used for different political use cases around the globe. But I was going to cite two examples from Kenya um, of how the platform has been used since its creation. One of those is Ushaguzi, which is a platform that was created for election monitoring, both in Kenya but in other African countries as well, and used there successfully to allow citizens to uh, report back from their um, um, uh, election areas and report on the process of the elections, whether there were any funny things going on or any transparencies. And um, it's been recognized by official election monitors as a great tool to foster citizen participation and to complete the picture because, of course, they can't be everywhere. Another instance of Ushahidi um, that's been used in Kenya is Umati, which is a project about hate speech. Um, so it was said that the hate speech was one of the main factors that caused this violent outbreak in 2007-2008. And um, the team around the iHub, which is an innovation hub in Nairobi, started a research, a research project called Umati, which has monitored hate speech in Kenya. It's the largest project about hate speech monitoring globally and recorded um, uh, yeah, for years, all different kinds of instances of hate speech. And this has been a really significant research project to A, um, map these things, but B, also to spur a discussion how to deal with hate speech online, and perhaps rather than crack down with government regulation, find ways that communities can address and work against hate speech. So yeah, Ushahidi is one of my favorite examples for an open source platform that's enabled many, many different ways of social um, yeah, change across the world, but especially also in the country where it was created. Great. I, th I think this is one of the really primary examples of uh, technology being used, and I think also Wheelmaps is, is based on that, but we'll come to that um, later on the same technology. I wanted to ask you about p platforms that have been in, in the public I am um, through the media, things like Campact and Change, and what are the advantages and disadvantages of these sorts of engagement platforms? Well, um, it gives uh, every one of us the opportunity to, to raise our voices for uh, special topics which might interest us. But um, I see the danger that um, th we, we face too many uh, possibilities to vote for or against something. And so sooner or later there will be a flood of petitions and uh, voting for or against something so that nobody will do it anymore or no politician will um, yeah, pay attention to it anymore because everyone is doing it for any case of like I don't want Markus Lanz anymore at Wettendas or a real relevant uh, a social political topic like transparency or um, the end of nuclear power or whatever which might be more relevant and um, as I told you before, there was a petition on uh, change.org um, dealing with, with, with a boy with Down syndrome. Today, for example, is um, World Down Syndrome Day because today is the 21st of March, uh, which is Trisomy 21. <laughs> um, so <laughs> today is the World Down Syndrome Day. And um, there was a petition at change.org um, 
uh, of parents uh, of this boy who wanted to um, uh, uh, yeah, ask for help that their, their, their son can go to the gymnasium. And um, it was a Henry petition, which uh, got a lot of media attraction here in Germany. And there was a counter uh, a petition, even on change.org. Uh, and for me, that was kind of a big problem, because um, the person who suffers is a child. And if you face, as a child, a petition against you, uh, it might be a very hard and saddened situation uh, for the parents and it's very emotional and uh, I don't see the, the um, how to say the uh, uh, political dimension behind uh, of being against a boy uh, uh, coming to a gymnasium. <laughs> Uh, the political dimension might be how can we support schools uh, to be more inclusive, but not we don't want this boy in my class. You know what I mean? So uh, that is some kind of um, big, big challenge we have to face when we deal with change.org or other petition platforms. But what is the, um, let's say, the advantage of CAMPAC? Because we also discussed that they are doing it a little bit differently. Um, well, in, in comparison to change.org, there's Campact, and um, what I like about Campact is that they uh, focus on special topics. Um, there's a, uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, an office in the background who research um, which might be relevant topics where we can really make action to change um, the decision makers' opinions, and um, how can we influence them to, to decide the other way as they wanted to decide before. And um, that is something which might be moderated, curated uh, in a better political uh, uh, way uh, than uh, change.org where everyone can start a petition. So um, I don't believe in give everyone the possibility to vote for everything <laughs> because um, you might need some kind of more information <laughs> uh, instead of yes or no. Um, Raul, you are um, very experienced in doing campaigns off and online. Where do you they see? They say I, I'm not sure if I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it. <laughs> uh, what do you think are the, the biggest challenges to bring these two dimensions together? Um, well, my my most uh, um, uh, liked and non-successful uh, campaign was the uh, Coney campaign, mm. which got a lot of uh, attraction, media attraction but nothing happened. Um, everyone should talk to their politicians uh, by the 20th of April, but nobody did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, nobody got the message. And what I, what I, I believe is that it's very important to, to focus on, on one special topic, like uh, um, uh, something you can really experience in your daily life. Uh, for example, our project wheelmap.org, um, which is just an online crowdsourcing platform where people can rate uh, restaurants and cafes by accessibility. Mm -hmm. If the entrance has steps in the front, yes or no? Mm -hmm. That's the only question we ask. And that is something everyone can understand. But nobody uh, runs with a ruler uh, through the city to measure out how wi w wide is the, the, the the door entrance or how high is the, the um, step in, in front. So, which might, w um, the, the balancing between uh, what can we done online is um, how precise is the question you ask. What, what kind of information do you want from the user? It's easier um, to ask him for yes or no, but he won't add um, postal code. He won't add the height of a step because he doesn't know how high it is. And um, of course, wearmap.org is only a mapping platform where we can see which place is accessible or not. But until now, we haven't made any place accessible. So the political dimension behind this might be, how can we raise awareness for um, restaurant owners or politicians to make laws or to buy a ramp for their cafe and restaurant uh, to be, get more accessible. And so we started a second project, which is called wheelramp.de, where you can just buy a ramp <laughs> for, 
Uh, it's a single serving website, one pager, just by a ramp, 1.2 uh, meters long. Yeah. And um, you can buy it or, or leave it, but you, we, we don't give you any excuse anymore uh, that you don't know where to get a ramp. So yeah. just do Good. it. <laughs> that, uh, does it answer your question? Okay. It does, yeah. yeah. Um, Zeraldine, I mean, you spoke about Ushahidi, and um, this is, as I said, uh, one of the best examples, but many campaigns that we refer to are also campaigns that rather gather likes and shares. What is your take on these campaigns that are very prominent also on the social networks right now? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the net has so much space for so many different kinds of forms of participation. And of course, there are things that go across that are just um, trends and we wonder about their real impact and the message they have. And I guess the most prominent of the last year has been the ice bucket challenge. Um, and you could say in many ways that did serve to spur a debate about a disease that was otherwise not known about. However, um, uh, very often with these campaigns, um, you mentioned Coney before, there's very little follow up and there's very little communication to the people that participate to what actually comes about it. And I guess that's one rule when you organize participatory projects that you would always you know, have this thumb rule of saying you have to involve the people not just in the height of the phase of the action, but also in the outcomes and communicate what came of it. And that's something that those campaigns definitely lack. Um, I think there's space and room for um, creating just in numbers. Sometimes in activism, it's important to be able to show these many thousand people will support this and to have these kind of numbers and to feel that there's a mass of people backing something in order to create a door opener to perhaps um, talk to politicians and have something in your hand. Um, but I think those campaigns can only really be taken seriously if they're accompanied, like you mentioned earlier as well, by other forms of political action too. Right. Um, and I think, um, all this, what we see right now with the possibilities, uh, 20 years ago was a bit different. And I think when, when Raul started his first NGOs with Salahed and he was in his mid 20s, so things, it was the beginning of the internet. How has your work changed since then? Or is it basically the same with a little bit more of internet? Um, well, when we started, we already um, used the internet. <laughs> um, it, yeah, as, as good as we could. Uh, because uh, we didn't have an office uh, in, in 2004. We, we didn't have an office, and uh, so we managed a lot by email or um, by a customer relationship management tool. We used uh, still high rise from 37 signals. And um <coughs> so we started to manage everything online, cloud-based, and later on there came, came services like um, calendars, uh, online sharing, and uh, something like Dropbox or BitSync. And um, so we, uh, until now, we are still a mostly cloud-based uh, office management software using uh, a nonprofit organization, but now we have an office. So that's the only difference. <laughs> um, and with an office, you have the um, advantage that you can um, have regular uh, work, work times. So you come at 10 and leave at 6. And uh, before of that, we just had the, the situation that we, we met ourselves in, in a cafe or in a restaurant or in my room or uh, at Ikea or in, a, in the ring barn. <laughs> and um, yeah, an interesting point because Ikea is very comfortable if you want to start a startup <laughs> because you have, you have, you have uh, offices in there. <laughs> you can buy everything. You have power supply under the tables. You have a cantina, and you have toilets. <laughs> Your only lack of internet, and um, but until now with uh, yeah, WMTS sticks, uh, everything might be easier. <laughs> um, and and yeah, we we worked there for uh, two days, and it worked <laughs> very well. Uh, but now we have an office. And um, <laughs> what what I really like is um, to to think about how many efforts do you need um, or invest to, to, to do everything by your own, by yourself. And 
For example, with wearmap.org, we are in 23 languages online. Oh. And um, of course, nobody of us is able to speak 23 languages. We started with German and English, and then we asked the wheelmap community what kind of language can they add to the wheelmap, the users. And so we gave them a, an, a, an online uh, um, possibility to, to translate every single word we use in wheelmap. So the fifth language we went online was Klingon. <laughs> <laughs> because, because there's anyone out there, I don't know who, wa who it was, uh, who can speak Klingon. <laughs> and now you can use the wheel mapping Klingon. I don't know if it's necessary or <laughs> useful, but it works. And the sixth language was Japanese. I don't know why, but uh, there was someone who could speak Japanese. And um, now we are online in, uh, in Polish and uh, in a lot of languages. And um, that is something you could only do through the internet by asking users for help and be being transparent for what you need help. Can I also answer the question? Sure. Thank you. First of all, I guess it's so happy for the better house that IKEA didn't have internet, otherwise it's, they wouldn't exist today. <laughs> no <laughs> business model there. Um, yeah, I, I was just thinking whilst you were speaking, so I also, like back when the internet was young, this is great, this is old people reminiscing about the internet. Um, like in 1999, we started an NGO when I had just started university, which connected different youth magazines and um, like um, student papers. Um, and basically, I think for me, one of the big differences back then was that we had to create our own tools. So basically, we built a blogging platform way before there were any blogging platforms to allow young people to publish and tell their own story and write autonomously on the net. And that was a very adventurous time. Like You had to have way more technical capacity than you need today with this wild, you know, like just so much, so many tools to choose from today. <clears throat> and I think another difference that I would point out is back then the internet was still more rogue and the possibilities of what you could do politically were also so much more experimental. So back then we had very passionate discussions about using DOS attacks, so denial of service attacks, as a legitimate form of protest, like a form of demonstrating on the internet. But of course that was back then because you needed a lot of people to do denial of service attacks and not one automated system as it is today. And now that sort of the internet has matured and so have the tools that we use, both in the sense that there are more tools available for activists, <coughs> but also there's much more legislation on what is legal and what is not legal. And some of the tools that we've discussed earlier have been integrated into our political systems, like petitioning platforms, for instance. Um, Geraldine, you also talked about um, your all these these tech startups from Africa. You would get in contact with, through your curation work with Republica with a lot of tech startups, and uh, also produced this film made in Africa. What was the main idea about the film and? Yeah, what, okay, what the so this, effect? this film has been quite a bit of a journey. So when I'm not organizing Republica or doing like events or digital activism in Germany, my actual day job is in development corporation and working with digital media, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa. So over the years, I've um, just gotten to know so many exciting, amazing people that do such great work to build up tech communities in their countries to really try to create social and economic change without waiting for big donors or big organizations and just taking matters into their own hands. And uh, part of my work at Republica, I've also always seen is making the discussions that we hold there more global. We have a tendency in Germany to kind of, as we'd say, swim a bit in our own soup and see a lot of the debates that we lead from a very national point of view. For instance, the debate we have about quality journalism versus bloggers for about you know years and years and years um, is led from a perspective which we have here because we have very high standards in journalism. But it's sometimes important to break that open and see things from a more global perspective. So I started bringing in more and more colleagues from other continents, basically, to speak at Republica. And in 2013, um, we did hosted something called the Global Innovation Gathering and brought in innovators from across the world to come and speak at Republica. And there was a friend of mine doing some filming work there. 
And he said to me uh, at the end of the conference, like, Geraldine, this is cool. You know, you're bringing these people on stage and you're getting more people getting to know about it. But this is, you know, not enough. Why don't we, why don't we make a movie about this so more people will get to know <laughs> about the great stuff happening there? I'm not a filmmaker, so it was a big experiment. But for me, um, the main aim of making this film was to create some um, piece of information that would show a modern, realistic, version of life in Africa to share some information about those digital innovations happening there and the people's stories that I've come to care about so much over the years. And just to break with some of those cliches that we're still presented with in media about Africa yeah. all the time. So the film doesn't wipe away any problems or critical issues, but it's a film about happy, well-adjusted people doing cool stuff in Africa. And what happened when the people there saw the film? That was a really overwhelming experience for me. Like I wasn't like this was last year at Republica. We showed the rough cut for the film for the first time, and I don't know if you, some of you know me. Like I get to like, moderate the stage one, and I've never been so nervous at any Republica moment before as when I showed all the protagonists in the film, uh, the the movie for the first time, and it was. Yeah, like I said, overwhelmingly positive and really a very emotional moment for me too, especially because they brought up a completely different use case, which wasn't just showing it to people here to create a better understanding, but they said, you know, they want all the politicians and people in their countries to see it too to create a better understanding for the work that they do. Like we have to translate a lot about the work that we do to, you know, parents, people working outside of our bubble, and they felt like this was a good tool to do it. Um, so, of course, that was a really happy thing for me. And how would you assess that um, uh, using the internet as a, um, a tool for, so for social movement, for big social movement? Uh, looking to internationally, I think in average there are 40% who have really access to the internet. How would you reflect that to really use digital media for, for bigger movement? Yeah, of course there are still huge issues about connectivity and access and those aren't to be just put aside because the majority of the world's population still lacks internet access, especially any kind of broadband internet access. However, I think there are many great examples that show you can use different kind of cross-media approaches to, um, yeah, to overcome those barriers. There are projects like Uraport in Uganda, which is an SMS telephone-based um, initiative that connects with young people across the whole country to do different kind of opinion polls um, and, and ask people young questions that are then brought into different other kind of media like radio shows and newspapers and are also brought forth to politicians to make them see what young people think. So if you see the possibilities that you have digitally connected with possibilities that you have to communicate with people via not just smartphones, but feature phones and traditional media, I do believe that they can be very powerful in developed as well as developing countries. Yeah. Raul, what, what strikes me s with, with your projects is that they're often uh, locally, hands-on, real life. As you said, Wheel Maps is, is based on a very, say on one challenge and uh, you addressed it. And uh, most recently you started a project called Broken Lifts. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more how that came about and uh, what the purposes of that. Um, a lot of people asked us uh, if we could do something about navigation for people in wheelchairs. So how, how can I get from A to B? Um, because through WeMap we already know which place is accessible, so we know B might be accessible, but <laughs> um, uh, how, how can I get there? And uh, we said, okay, routing is a very complex uh, uh, problem, <laughs> and there might be companies uh, who are working who can do it better than us as a small developing team, development team. And, um, but what we found out was that mobility for people with mobility impairments really relies on working elevators or lifts, <laughs> uh, especially in public transport like Berlin. And um, we, we found out that the BVG, the um, Berliner Verkehrsgesellschaft, um, published a hidden RSS feed of their not working elevators. But the S-Bahn didn't. So we started scraping the website uh, of the S-Bahn where they showed which places, uh, uh, which uh, elevator is uh, broken and um, merged it with the BVG data. So we could have one platform uh, which shows me which elevators of Berlin, Brandenburg public transport systems are working or not. Um, 
known by the companies, by the um, yeah, transport organizations. And because what nobody knows is that elevators are online. They tell the, the um, um, before give, for example, automatically if they are working or not. So they have SMS modules inside and um, they just send a ping. <laughs> and um, so it's a not a crowdsourcing platform. It's not something where people can tell us if an elevator is broken or not because nobody would tell us if an elevator is working. So everyone would say us it's broken, but maybe it's working again. So how reliable is this information for how long, for how uh, long time? And uh, so we, we, we just use this automatical data, which works very well. And now we are talking with the Deutsche Bahn to scale this project to whole Germany. Um, but it's a very complex system because um, elevators are seen as, um, okay, how to say, as a transport system in this um, uh, techni technical project management databases of the HAFAS. HAFAS is the company behind this um, tar plan managing systems. <laughs> and um, so they, they, they see elevators as a transport system from A to B and back. <laughs> And um, so it's a very complex system to make routing, but for Berlin Brandenburg, we, we, uh, it, now it, it's working, and now we want to scale it to other cities. But basically you're uh, supplying a, a b or creating a public service. So how is that being compensated, or in which way um, have you worked with the, uh, let's say, official? Yeah, we, we, we started with a hackathon at the Random Hack of Kindness uh, three years ago. And uh, that was a moment where we started scraping illegally the data from the S-Bahn. And um, two months later, the um, German, the, the Berlin um, uh, Minister of uh, uh, Economy and Science, what the fuck, WTF, <laughs> Minister of WTF, um, <laughs> Wirtschaft, Technologie und Forschung. <laughs> Did you know that? Then, then WTF it's called. Um, <laughs> Zen WTF, Senator für Wirtschaft, Technologie und Forschung. Uh, and um, he, he, he said to us, okay, um, open data is a nice topic because we, we want to, to open this data to, um, to the public. And uh, Berlin wa wants to be one of the yeah, um, most uh, um, uh, active cities de con dealing with open data. And um, so we... we uh, they, they asked us if we can do something together with the Verkehrsverbund Berlin Brandenburg, which is the head organization of BVG and Esman. And they paid us um, for making this project happen. Um, and uh, the idea is to develop it uh, so that you can get an SMS or an email if an elevator you chose is broken or not. Um, but until now, we just are showing which uh, elevator is uh, running or not. Great, so, so basically they depend on open innovation on sources Today, coming from the outside. Yeah, and, and uh, the, the funny, pun, funny fun part is that in Berlin we have 400 elevators, more or less. 16 of them are broken right now. So it's not every elevator is broken, <laughs> it's just 16 of them. And uh, that is something which might be some kind of uh, a good tool to, to discuss on how can we make the service better. Is it really so that every time every elevator is broken, which might be the ranting situation of the people? <laughs> or is it um, how can we make the services better? Maybe it's just the Otis elevator which are broken, but not the ones from Schindler. You know what I mean? So maybe we can gather information out of these uh, occurring uh, broken situations. That's interesting, finding hidden patterns, that's great. Yeah. Um, also, maybe that's a question for both of you. There, there used to be websites, and I think they're still around, um, how to fix your street or fix your street dot or co dot uk, I think it started in Britain, was quite successful. Do you see potential for this uh, city governments or uh, utilizing these sources, crowdsourcing to uh, say get rid of challenges like this? Yeah, I mean, I definitely see the potential in involving citizens like 
I think you know the projects that Raul does are such great examples and how to like empower citizens by giving them tools to do that to contribute to a functioning environment that they're living in. And the examples that you stated are also great platforms that do that. And you know, not for no reason is it that they've been copied and implemented in other countries in the world as well. I think um, the ambivalence, perhaps, or the danger, only lies where government is increasingly outsourcing those services to citizens and thereby ridding themselves of the responsibilities that they have to maintain functioning infrastructure and a functioning environment for citizens to live in. I think where there's a positive collaboration between government and citizens and just a reallocation of, of power and information, those are great tools, but they shouldn't serve as an excuse to privatize um, government responsibilities. I, I would totally agree on that. Um, we we figured out last year, we found out last year that uh, there have been several projects in Berlin which wanted to get funding from the Berlin government and th th they have been told you can only get money if you work together with Wheelmap. And we as Wheelmap, we have never seen any money from the Berlin government. So that is an outsourcing situation. And um, the WIMAP costs us a, f uh, a quarter million a year. So it's a very big advanced project. We have uh, Android app, uh, uh, iPhone app, which is very expensive to maintain and make updates on it. And, and, so, and most of the costs are um, personal costs. So it's not an office or a, a yacht. Uh, it's, just <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's just people. And um, so, uh, which, which, which makes me kind of angry because um, we are running this project, the people expect us, expect to, 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 um, to have this project for forever. They, they ask us if we can implement new features. Apple brings a new iPhone with bigger screens, so we have to make updates, but nobody pays it for us. And we have to start funding and fundraising. And when we ask the government for money, they say, well, you're running since four years, so why did you fail? And we said, a moment, uh, <laughs> we are just, okay, we are not that innovative as we have, might have been four years ago, but we need some kind of infra infrastructure support because uh, that is something in Germany you can't get. How can you avoid that, that, uh, that this is happening, like you say, this outsourcing? Well, we, we are forced to work together with companies like uh, Immobilien Scout. Um, we work together with uh, Google and um, we are yeah, still looking for money and make uh, crowdsourcing campaigns and uh, um, asking for donations. Uh, well, okay, it's, it's working some, some sort of, but we are still looking for money, of course. And um, the idea behind Wheelmap is not uh, um, to, to, how to say, um, to become the biggest project in the world and making some kind of competition to Google Maps. Mm -hmm. That is not the deal. Our deal is to say, okay, we want to raise awareness for the topic of accessibility on places mm -hmm. like restaurants and cafes or discos and or cinemas, whatever. And um, we want to convince Google, we want to convince Yelp, we want to convince Apple Maps to implement our information in their databases. And that's the reason why we uh, open our data, open our data. We are based on OpenStreetMap. So all the information we gather are synchronized uh, minutically uh, with the OpenStreetMap database. And the OpenStreetMap is like Wikipedia on maps. And um, so that is some kind of the sustainable moment of the wheel map. When we die tomorrow, the information will still maintain on the open street map um, because we can't guarantee to work for the upcoming 50 years on, on this project because it's really very expensive. But how would you then measure your success as an, as well, an NGO? A friend, of, uh, a founder friend of mine um, said uh, when we when we have one million places on the wheel map, then he will quit. Because just, okay, it's working. Now we have 500,000 places on it see, within uh, uh, four years. So it's very, the no, three years. So it's a very, um, well, fast growing platform. <laughs> and uh, I assume that in three years he will quit. <laughs> but um, um, we, we believe, we, we call our mission disability mainstreaming. 
that is our topic. So we want to raise awareness on accessibility and disability topics uh, um, for people without disabilities. And so if you can find out on Google Maps if the place where you want to meet your friend is accessible, that is the most mainstreaming moment we can achieve with the information we have. We are working together, for example, with um, Immobilien Scout on finding accessible flats um, for people with disabilities. Because there wasn't a platform, uh, Germany-wide, where you can find flats which are wheelchair accessible for your grandmother, whatever. And um, so we started just by implementing a new filter option in their database and asking the MACLA to add these information into their databases. And so now we grew to the biggest platform with together, well, they grew to the biggest pla platform uh, dealing with accessible flats. And that is something um, we believe as a nonprofit organization we can implement the idea of disability mainstreaming into other companies instead of doing everything on ourselves. So it's more like an agency, more like advocating, um, but on a very modern level, using smartphones, using modern tools and technology. <laughs> Good. No, to me, um, and no, you mentioned before that over the years you, you started utilizing different tools and I was asking earlier and looking into social media and, and I think the social media hype as such is, is over at the same time. It has become a normality, so it's part of our everyday communications. And so when you plan your activities, how do you involve this aspect? And I, I know personally you, you use Facebook a lot, but how do you use other social networks in your um, um, NGO activities? Instagram, Pinterest, all everything that is in Germany or isn't in Germany. What's the bouquet of your, uh, let's say, everyday work? Um, every project of us um, has a Twitter and a Facebook account or a page. And um, the most successful account uh, of uh, our organization is the uh, Facebook account of um, uh, lightmedian.de. Um, lightmedian.de <laughs> is a, a website where we want to teach journalists classical journalists from Spiegel Online to ZDF, whatever, where we want to educate journalists on how to speak um, without pity, without uh, raising bad or um, uh, heroic emotions uh, on people with disabilities. So not everyone having a disability is suffering, and not everyone having a disability is a hero. Uh, but most of the journalists um, write like that. So despite his disabilities, he's surviving whatever. Yeah? So that is something I read about myself. And um, so we, we started a platform to educate journalists on how to do it right, politically correct. And uh, we started two weeks before the Paralympics 2012. So it was a, we call it Fettnäpfchen site, um, <laughs> uh, right beforehand. And, um, so uh, my colleague started this Facebook page and we discussed with our users uh, articles we found on the web um, about people with disabilities. And through these discussions, we got some kind of um, idea on what are the biggest problems for, for journalists. Um, and the biggest problem is that journalists by themselves don't have personal contact to people with disabilities despite the one situation when they make an interview with you. So you might be the first person with disability <laughs> um, which the journalist is uh, confronted in his every whole life. You know what I mean? So you have a, a lot of um, Verantwortung, um, responsibility. And um, through these discussions on, on, on Facebook, uh, we, we, for example, found out that journalists have a lot of problems on finding the right words. Yeah? Is it allowed to say Mongo to people with Down syndrome? I read it in newspapers still. Yeah? Uh, is it allowed to say Krüppel or Kripple? Um, is it um, um, or uh, how do I find a, a, a good picture of someone in a wheelchair? 
And the most interesting par part is last week I found out that there is one picture <laughs> of a girl in a wheelchair where the, where the wheel of the wheelchair is twice as big as a girl in it because it uh, has been photographed from down, from, from the bottom up. So the wheel is very big. And this picture is always used in every newspaper in the Tagesschau, in ZDF Heute Journal, uh, when they talk about inclusion and education. So, but the problem is the big, um, the, the, the picture so shows the problem, the wheelchair, and the big wheel, and the, it's a big uh, obstacle, something, it's disturbing. But it's not showing the educational part, the inclusion, inclusive part, that some people are learning together, pupils are learning together in a school. <laughs> and to answer your, to answer your question, um, uh, what we now are starting to do is uh, start a, a picture database with good images, <laughs> just with good images for journalists um, to use in Tagesschau or Tagesspiegel or whatever uh, to exchange or delete the bad images from the DPA image databases or Getty or whatever to replace them with new ones. Can I? I'd Please go ahead. I'd mm -hmm. just be interested in asking the question from a different perspective because I think it's, you know, I, th I think you have so many great examples of using, <coughs> you know, tools that are so easily available, but yet a lot of people don't. Something easy like using Wikipedia or something else to create a picture base. Um, but, but I would be interested because we spoke about like the history of the internet and our early projects earlier on. How easy do you find it to keep up, like with new platforms and new tools and integrating those? not just privately, but in your work. How, how to what does that do now? Like how easy do you find it to keep up with new tools and new platforms, like you're not using, okay, I'll, gi I'll give an example. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, we always talk about like soon Facebook is coming to an end and yeah. something else is gonna arise. Well, <laughs> I think we all learned that the time is coming soon when uh, Bundesregierung joined Facebook mid-February. Then it's over. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's done. And did you all? And it's definitely yeah, over. Ask a, a sign of my. Did anybody visit the official Facebook page now that was recently launched by the? It's, it's better than Facebook? expected. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I had such such fun. I laughed so hard. Okay, has anybody visited it? Two people. Okay, Three it's worth. I I, rem I recommend it purely for entertainment purposes, um, not a, just because, but also because Bundesregierung decided to <coughs> add. Um, like a post for every major historical um, event and every chancellor dating back to Adenauer and you keep scrolling down, scrolling like wondering, okay, you know, <laughs> what's next? What's weirder, next? weirder. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I guess weirder and weirder by the minute. Um, so they decided, you know, obviously the internet isn't complete if um, the Bundesregierung doesn't input Germany's entire history of the Bundesrepublik on Facebook, which is done now, so <laughs> relief. Um, within two weeks. <laughs> yeah, within two weeks. So, um, and I, I visited a panel, uh, one of my favorite events that I visited last year was a panel at Reeperbahn Festival, which was just teenagers, teen, like 14 to 16 year olds explaining the internet to grown ups. And this is a really fascinating session because a, you know, they were saying things like, oh, I'm only on Facebook to talk to my teachers and parents. I don't actually spend any social time there. And they were also so insightful when it came to what kind of tools they use because, for instance, it was one strong case for using Snapchat and not Instagram because of the durability of the pictures. Mm -hmm. So instead of instantiating your life and having to have the perfect selfie before going to school in the morning, you'd rather use something like Snapchat because you don't have to like make your life look perfect all the time because it's just visible for the moment. And I'm you know, I'm really comfortable using all the tools that we're accustomed to in my work, and I wouldn't know how else to do my work most of the time, but to be honest, like venturing and keeping up with all new platforms and making sure you're on board, I don't find the easiest thing, so I was wondering no, it's how it's It's very hard to, to um, last week we started our first WhatsApp channel, <laughs> so just we wanted to, to test uh, if there might be a younger target group for us uh, to reach, and um, what I really want to, to start this year is uh, to work more with these push notifications because um, we can in, in our iPhone app, um, if the user allows it, um, we can target people in, uh, in, um, in 
in regions, by region. So we can tell every person having the Wimap app installed in Hamburg mm -hmm. to make a run on something or uh, in Berlin or whatever. So that is something where you can activate people again, back again. But um, that is, yeah, it's not very interactive. It's just one way push notification. You can't push back. And um, yeah, that is what we try to 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 use. Yeah, I'm wondering if you if you look at campaigning, for instance. I mean, there are different uh, campaigns. Who ones are more political, ones are uh, less. Like a, a, a free hugs campaign, or now the the what was it again? The ice bucket challenge. I mean, if you look at that, for instance, uh, how do you think about social networks and campaigning if it's always a very entertaining, uh, it has an entertaining character? It's not very, s uh, how serious can a campaign be uh, on a social platform? Um, today, I, I was for my first time on You Now. Mm -hmm. Is, uh, has every, uh, any one of you been on You Now the last days, weeks, whatever? Have you been? You okay. now is a live streaming video platform. Uh, you you log in and you are online if you want to, and you stream live with your webcam picture, and um, like what? No, okay. Uh, it's like it's like Google Hangout, but everyone is making Hangouts on it. <laughs> and um, is it as bad as chat roulette or? Well, it's uh, you, well, a chat roulette is randomly, but that is uh, you can go to a specific person okay. and stay there. And um, the most awkward moment, I, I just visited the most famous right now at this uh, day, at this hour when I was there. There was a girl um, whose only mission was to get more than 5,000 likes. And um, if she gets 5,000 likes, she will eat a melon, a lemon, a lemon. And uh, so I was watching for 10 minutes. And um, because someone uh, in a chat said, okay, when you reach 5,000 likes, you eat a lemon. And uh, so she took her laptop, went through her house to the kitchen, <laughs> got a, a lemon, went back and showed her rabbit, her parents, her sister, whatever, went back to her room. And within this 10, minute, 10 minutes, she got 2,000 new Followers, not likes, followers. So I was so blown away how, how fast this community is growing, but the quality of, of conversation is so bad because, <laughs> because 200 people are chatting uh, to one girl who of course can't answer everyone and just pick some, some kind of situation out. and most lemon. of the situation was fucking so they, they all wanted to fuck this girl and um, <laughs> that is very awkward this was that's ah. that very awkward but I mean I mean I, we talk about this so much and usually the the explanation you come to is that of course you know society is mirrored on the internet and the level of conversation in general society is probably also pretty banal most of the time yeah and and the ambivalence of these things like yes they can be used for great very profound things but they can also be used for really random things and i guess you know crowdfunding is another example of that like I failed dismally trying to f crowdfund for my film, and I thought I had a really good cause with a really well explainable, very clear kind of mission, and I had a really low target too. And I have a f you know relatively good community, so I thought like, okay, this is gonna totally happen, this is gonna work out. But it just it was terrible. It was a horrible experience. If you ever want to like hear about failed crowdfunding experiences, I'm really happy to talk about this. But um, then other people. Which platform did you use? Indiegogo. Yeah, it's, it w I wouldn't say it was the platform's fault at all. It was, yeah, a lot of different factors that contributed. And at the same time, you watch somebody who s sells making potato salad and get $500,000 for it, right? <laughs> for making a potato salad. And you think, like, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> there's something broken with this. But that, yeah, I think it just, like we usually say, it mirrors so much of, like, people want to be entertained and people are going to be willing to um, the kind of, you know, click to like something, click to share something, click to fund something that is just going to be entertaining but and not very effectful. When, when we talk about this new, well, social 
uh, um, social media technologies, whatever, uh, I, I sometimes um, have the feeling that we believe that in the, uh, back in earlier times everything was better, but it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was worse content too, and what maybe it's uh, 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 something we need to, to, to take some time to develop storytelling formats for you now, yeah, where you can get a cause and not make a haul on your best beauty products. I mean, think about how people spoke about Twitter when it first started, yeah. right? You know, the Deklovan des Internets, like yeah. the toilet door of the internet, and the now it's one of the most important manus, yeah. tools for journalists on the internet. Yeah, but now you can really make a lot of uh, uh, attraction through Twitter um, mm -hmm. for your cause. Hashtagging. Yeah. Yeah. Jan Böhmermann. I mean, Jan Böhmermann uh, is making <laughs> a hashtag every week and uh, making the I would also to like top trends. to know your opinion because we, uh, we talked about these two projects. Um, uh, one of the one laptop per child by Nicolas Nicroponte and the other one, the hole in the wall project by Zugata Mitra. No one, it's, it's, um, it's more about the question because. Um, uh, Nicroponte says the device is important to get access uh, or to, to create a social change and uh, uh, Mitra says uh, or claims that it's the information and how you share it. So I wouldn't go into both projects because it's more the question, what do you think? Is it the device or is it the information to start? It is a, a tricky movement. question when you ask that, especially in developing context, because I want to give a bit of a broader answer, but maybe just um, Vitra's assumption is based on the fact that he's a physical sci physicist, physical scientist. That was not the quite right. <laughs> but, um, so he has mathematic calculations on how children best learn, not as individuals, but in small groups. And his um, supplying technology for children to learn with are very much based on those mathematic and scientific assumptions of giving people a shared device to use in a group and communicate with one another. Now, um, both projects are very interesting to watch and uh, there are many different uh, cases around the world um, that show different things and how effectful children can learn with technology. But I think we have a very current discussion um, going on about whether information has to come first or access has to come first. And that uh, discussion currently is around um, zero rating services in the world. So um, I don't know if any of you have followed this discussion, but it's a very fundamental discussion when it comes to the question of net neutrality and what kind of um, access should be provided to people. So for instance, Facebook uh, in many uh, countries across Africa, but in the whole world now, but they launched first in Africa, offers their service Facebook Zero. So that means that they have a deal with the ISP, with the telecommunication providers, that anybody having a phone, and this is often not a smartphone, but again a feature phone, can access Facebook for free independent of whether they have any data contract or not. So it won't cost people to access Facebook. And for many people in developing countries, Facebook is the internet because they can access everything there and they can communicate with people there, but they cannot go beyond that. And now there are different initiatives picking up on that idea. So Facebook has started the inter um, initiative internet.org. So it's not just Facebook, but a number of other services, including BBC, but interestingly, I think this is the most interesting case, including Wikipedia, mm -hmm. that um, you can, countries that have signed up to using internet.org um, access this array of services for free. And you could say this is great because people need information first. I find it really scary, personally, to be honest, because it gives you a pre-curated version of the internet. And it's kind of like it feels to me in a way like Facebook is swallowing the internet. Yeah. So whilst the platform is becoming perhaps increasingly unimportant to young people as a social media platform in our countries, they are presenting themselves as one, the accessible version in the internet in many countries to people cannot otherwise access. And um, so this is a very, very tricky debate because of course in many, many countries you could say yes, the information is the most important thing. Would you not want, for instance, that people have access to Wikipedia in Ebola-stricken countries to be able to inform themselves about the disease and the consequences? Of course you would. But looking at the greater effects of it and what that implies for the internet and internet freedom on a broader picture, I think, you know, it would be so great if these big internet platforms and companies would fund in collaboration with ISPs 
a minimal amount of free internet access where people can choose to go to whatever site they want rather than pre-curating the internet for people. So access yeah. matters perhaps access more than matters. information, but okay. yeah. <laughs> okay, good, thanks. Great. Actually, I wanted to come back to, to the, the topic that we discussed with Raul before. Um, um, the entertainment factor of <laughs> campaigns and um, the different formats. And this is, uh, you chose a book as a format to tell your story. So your biography is out, it's called so, uh, I Didn't Want to Be a Roofer Anyway. Dachdecker wollte ich eh nicht werden. Let me, um, yeah, that's the book, so if you ever, this, and the thing about a book is it's, there's a beginning and there's an end. And um, also this book has, let's say, the, the, s the sad end, the funny aspects of, of your life and the pr your perspective and sharing it, and uh, it's a great read. Um, but how do you continue to tell your story digitally? For me, it's like, how do you use humor to make people better understand or relate or get you? Um, there's a lot, a lot of question in one question. <laughs> um, okay, maybe I, I, I try to start uh, with a book. Uh, when I when I was asked by the Verlag, uh, by the publisher, if I want to write a book, I totally was saying no, <laughs> because um, they wanted me to bi to write a biography, and I said, okay, I'm 33 years old, how <laughs> I don't want to die tomorrow, so uh, a biography might be something, at least a half biography, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, it was weird, this uh, question. And then a friend of, friend of mine told me, okay, but not everyone is being asked by a publisher, especially a Robold Verlag, um, to write a book for them. Normally it's a situation uh, other way around where you are looking for a publisher publishing your book. And so it was a chance I had to take. Uh, that was a feeling. And the second question was, okay, I'm a blogger. I'm a Twitterer, I'm a Facebook user, but I'm not a writer. And I went to the publisher and told them, I hate writing. Uh, 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 an empty word page makes me well, fear. <laughs> and um, so they told me, no problem. We sent you someone who helps you to um, write a book, like a co-authoring, co-author. And uh, that was Marion Appelt, um, and together with her, we, we started to, to uh, think about what can we write if it's not a biography. And okay, it came out a bi biography, but um, it's not from the beginning of my birth until uh, um, the present. It's, uh, it just has a different point of view, like how I started accepting my own disability. So that is the, um, the question uh, of the book. And that is something I'm, I'm, I'm still doing. I'm still st uh, accepting my disability. I, I'm not done yet. And I believe that I'm going to, when I'm, when I'm dying, I, I still didn't accept it uh, all in all its um, uh, situations and, and um, moments. And I, but I also started to realize that there's a, a big political dimension behind why it's so hard for me and for other people to accept disabilities, to accept someone's disability, ac to accept his own disability. And maybe you can compare it also t uh, with uh, gender topics. Like, um, although 50% of the society are women, um, women don't have the same uh, um, uh, possibilities to, to um, fight for their rights and uh, like, like uh, men have. And um, th the same situation is happening with people with disabilities. And then I was working uh, six years ago at a radio station. And um, there we were forced to, to think about how can we make a story within three minutes? <laughs> uh, and how can we tell something relevant? Not about uh, Robin Williams in Berlin, but maybe about Koma Saufen within three minutes. And or abortion or something ver very relevant. And um, so I, it came to my mind, what can I do on Facebook? What can I do on Twitter? And my idea is, right uh, and still now, is to at least bring for one minute a day um, people without disabilities a glimpse into my life of someone with a disability. These awkward moments 
these awkward moments you face, in, or, and funny moments too, you face when you enter a bus and everyone is looking at you. At you. Or this uh, um, nice moment where uh, someone in a bus is uh, um, helping you uh, um, getting the ramp out of it instead of the bus driver. So, and without asking this person, just doing it voluntarily because this person has seen it times ago and learned how, how to use it. And that is, that is inclusion. And that is something I, w I want to show the people back, what happens in my daily life. And um, so to answer your question, I'm trying to, to uh, write the book further on Facebook, but there are a lot of more um, things I tell on Facebook. Um, but it's with this kind of humor and, uh, but also um, uh, uh, ernst, um, serious moments. Uh, um, I'm trying to make a mixture uh, without asking for pity, just for empathy. Right. Talking about uh, inclusion, uh, do you think that the government, the German government, is lacking here uh, on bringing awareness to this topic? And how do you do that? Compared to. Compared to, I think you're more in the topic than. <laughs> Um, well, compared to other countries in Europe, Germany is lagging a lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a, I, I, we don't need to open up a political discussion here, but um, I'm, I, I believe that the most relevant topic on inclusion and people with disabilities in Germany is that uh, people without disabilities don't have enough contact to people with disabilities, although 10% of the society has a disability. Uh, not 10% of our friends have a disability. And we have to ask ourselves why. And that's because of the um, exclusion of people with disabilities in our educational and kindergarten systems, and um, which is done systematically. So we have Sonderschulen, we have Förderschulen, it's a big problem. And there are countries like Canada, but also uh, the Scandinavian countries, who closed all their Förderschulen and Sonderschulen and put the money into regular schools mm. and um, uh, just to, to uh, um, mix the, 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 the vi vi variety of people with and without disability in one classroom and in one school. And um, statistics show worldwide, uh, also in Germany, that uh, people and pupils learning in uh, regular schools with people with disabilities together are performing better and having better social skills uh, than in, in Germany, like on gymnasiums, where only non-disabled people are being taught and on Federschulen, where only people with disabilities are being taught. And on Federschulen, not everyone is able to make an Abitur, although he has the capacity, uh, but the school doesn't have. So we have really a big educational problem here in Germany. Right. I think b before we open up the discussion um, to the audience, um, one more question for Zeralina. I mean, as, as part of a Digitale Gesellschaft, you're probably also dealing with uh, digital literacy and educational system. And uh, are you running into s similar difficulties in then reaching um, governmental, let's say, um, offices to uh, encourage that change in the education? Um, yeah, I thought you were going to ask something completely different, so which is why I was a bit like, what? Because I thought you were going to ask a gender question now. Um, <laughs> but uh, maybe I can answer both. Um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I think this is a total truism that everybody knows that we still have a lot of catching up to do when it comes to looking at our school system and how to integrate media education in that, how to integrate um, education about t all the ethical aspects, um, and maybe not just in one subject, but in all the different subjects in school, from political um, classes to ethical classes to uh, religion, etc. cetera, um, all the different implications about creating opportunities to teach people how to code in schools, um, so I think, yes, there is still a lot of catching up to do when it comes to educational, um, um, and uh, uh, yeah, integration of digital aspects into our education system. I think that, you know, the, the pressure is there also now because of this whole Industrialisierung 4.0 and, you know, German government's campaign to wake up to, um, 
you know, the need to sort of digitize German economy more than it perhaps has been the fact that there's a lot of pressure on these issues and, and perhaps a bit more movement will come into this uh, than we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, yeah, I thought you were going to ask me a gender issue. <laughs> uh, Please question. answer that question. Like I said, <laughs> because, um, yeah, I don't know if I'm so well equipped to answer the question right now because I'm deeply traumatized by the experience that I had across the last week because I had to spend a whole week at CBIT. And <laughs> it was, yeah, from in many, many ways. But it, um, it, situations like that very often make me realize how, and I'm really happy to say this, um, some of the um, internet community bubbles that I work in, or I would say we work in, are so advanced when it comes to um, considering um, gender issues within the community, trying to create a gender balance of speakers. If you look at the Chaos Communication Congress, also what we try to do at Republica, um, and not just uh, gender as in male, female, but all kinds of people with um, different um, yeah, with uh, different kinds of um, life views and different ways that they lead their life and being very, very inclusive to all of these. And that makes me very proud of my community, but it also makes me very angry at other communities. Okay. I was in so many drive-by situations, uh, like drive-by co conversations with like, you know, I'm, so I'm sorry if anybody feels, well, I'm not really sorry if anybody feels offended, but like just, old men in suits <laughs> talking about the hostess standing right next to them in a really derogatory way, being the only woman on stage for four days out of five days a week, and being even told that one of the reasons I was chosen was because I am a woman and not because of the content that I bring to the table. And the very, not just that this is all like this, but the fact that nobody thinks about it. It's not even an issue, yeah? And it's um, nothing that people want to discuss, and if you do discuss it, every man that I talked about it with at CBIT immediately has 20 good reasons why introducing quotas, for instance, is a terrible idea, mm -hmm. yeah? And I just, I'm regularly so shocked when I walk outside of my little bubble, my community, into any other media or IT bubble um, by finding how archaic things still are in this country. Yeah, you only can hope that there are some spillover effects. If they look at Republica and the, all these other conferences. It, yeah, I believe that there needs to be, there needs to be like grave political change and, and you know, it's time to like stop waiting to actually um, wait for something to happen and by itself in these areas, you know, we need action that is going to also, I think, lead to this change because it's not going to come about otherwise in a regulatory sense. Yeah. I totally agree <laughs> to her observations. I have the same feelings. Sometimes. I think that's a perfect closing and an opening up to the audience for questions. But thank you so far, <laughs> Geraldine and Raoul. Anybody up there? Oh, very good. And um, just adding to what you finished off, um, what do you think about quotas? Speaking about women or disability, because that's a big topic, and, and there's like a lot of women saying no quota for women, and then there's a lot of men saying we need a quota to kind of regulate ourselves. How do you feel about that? Um, yeah, I mean, we we just we talked about this beforehand. So um, yeah, I am definitely for quotas because, like I said, I think regularly there needs to be a regulatory um, framework for things to change because we're not seeing any change otherwise. But do you think the right people will then be nominated? Well, uh, and when you look at the statistics, uh, especially on p um, uh, gender questions, um, women are and. Um, nearly most of all uh, um, subjects performing better at education than men. And um, so if you are really looking for skills, women should already have been dominating us, but they don't. And so if you, if you use a quota, um, I would of course agree to, there might be some women who might be in the wrong place but there are a lot of men who are also on the wrong place. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, just, we just have to start doing it and using it as a Brücken technology, yes, for that's example. exactly the term I was thinking <laughs> of too, yeah. <laughs> Until it's not needed, um, but 
yeah, we, we use it and we need it uh, because it's not done yet. And for example, when we talk about this 30% uh, uh, of women quota at DAX concern uh, companies, uh, that are only 300 jobs in Germany we are talking about. 300 jobs. That is nothing. That is a half of Immobilien Scout. You know? So it's nothing. I totally agree. <laughs> Any more questions out there? I was blinded by the slide. Oh. I think there is a microphone on the left. I'm going, please. Uh, well, I came across an interesting um, idea a couple of weeks ago. Um, somebody was um, drawing parallels between the um, black activist sixties and seventies in the US and um, the movements today like Arab Spring, etc. And um, what uh, she pointed out was that uh, the social coherence um, that was created um, through the fact that uh, those um, activists in the sixties and seventies didn't have all those tools we have today um, but grew much stronger than um, than we see that today in, in, in similar movements. And um, which led to resilience within the group, which allowed the group to react better to um, new circumstances. And it seems that this resilience is missing today in, 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 in movements um, like the Arab Spring. What's your take on that? I cannot give you a scientific answer with any opposing research to that. I can just give you a personal impression. But I, all friends that I have who, for instance, live in Egypt and were involved in both attempts of revolution within what is called the Arab Spring, I do not think they lack resilience at all. And also when I look at that activism that we do here in Germany with the NGO that I'm involved in, Die Tate Gesellschaft, but also all other net political NGOs. I think we're really resilient too. <laughs> and um, I, I don't think I'd necessarily agree with that assumption. I think that there are many factors making the world very complex and it's sometimes being very difficult to upkeep the engagement that you have. But if you're f like faced with either like as, as is the case, for instance, in Egypt with brute violence by the regime as a reaction to your activism, of course, it's hard to upkeep it um, in the way you would perhaps like to. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm totally, uh, um, I, I have problems to answer those questions because comparing um, the black activism in the 16s to the, to the um, uh, Arab Spring is, what came to my mind is in the 60s, uh, America, United States of America still has been, uh, uh, still was a, d a democracy, and the Arab countries haven't been. So maybe it's easier, or it was easier to, to change uh, or to, to, uh, to fight for equal rights uh, within a, a democratic system. Um, without, you, you know what I mean? I am trying to, in English it's very hard <laughs> to, uh, to answer your question, but, but um, I would say the uh, um, Ausgangsbedingungen, changing a democracy is uh, easier instead of changing uh, a regime, a terror regime, uh, with a lot of torture and, and death sentences or whatever it has been uh, still having there. And uh, I, uh, maybe the conflict in the in Arabian countries, Arabic countries are, more complex than a r only in uh, uh, quote, uh, quotation marks only uh, races or racial discussions uh, in one country. And I mean, there are so many takes that you could go into this from because you could say that um, I guess another comparison you could make is like, why did the Occupy movement not go further in evoking actual change in the U.S. Um, which I think, you know, that is part of a long-term movement of change of perspective within a system where the power is held so, so tightly by few people. And, and I think the last year also showed that when it comes to, um, yes, of course, um, 
fundamental change was created by the black power movement and equality was enforced in many areas, but in many, many other ways, the US is still an extremely racist country, especially when it comes to systemic racism, which was shown in Ferguson and, and other cases across the last year. So change is gradual and can have different ways that it expresses itself, but also swings back and forth. Maybe that's also another part of answer to your question. Who's next? Uh, hi. I was wondering, are you experiencing a change in, um, what's the word, censorship, or when you do social campaigns and topics that are a little bit sensitive, maybe, ethical topics, um, is it changing how people discuss with each other? Are people getting better at exchanging on social media? Because often you don't, you don't have a person sitting in front of you responding, so it's easy to just throw something out there without thinking about the, the effect. <laughs> Until today, tomorrow, before I was on you now, um, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about, yeah, young people are still, uh, or, or are getting more awareness on privacy and uh, <laughs> and all these topics but now, but now um, <laughs> I'm not so sure anymore um, uh, a, a friend of mine and their children uh, um, are very uh, um, how to say uh, vorsichtig uh, using the careful. internet uh, uh, what very careful carefully using the internet and um, so they never type any email addresses anywhere on their phone numbers or names or even their their gender is not um, they, they are not writing on the internet so they are using it more passively and anonymously but um, when I've been at you now today uh, there was a girl as I mentioned showing her her rabbit her parents and her whole house and um, I mean she was smoking with 15 years in front of a camera <laughs> I'd, it's so wrong on so many levels <laughs> but I see there um, that I'm not sure yeah, I think this is another gradual issue, and, and I, I think all, I have different impressions of this too. On the one hand, I would say that, you know, in a post Snowden world, the awareness for privacy and data security amongst activists has increased. I do see more and more people using email encryption and anonymity tools, and also people that aren't necessarily internet activists who just decided to look into this because it, you know, it's in the general field of their democratic interests that they want their privacy to be um, protected. And on the other hand, that reality that Raul just described is definitely true too. And this sort of, um, you know, I, had, I mean, of course, we've had many, many debates about this, what I have nothing to hide kind of mentality. However, I do, I, 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 I reject the notion that society doesn't care I think that's a great rhetoric that politics also uses to sort of wind out of the limelight. And, and I, I don't think that is true at all. I have many conversations with people from all different traits of life, you know, from taxi drivers to people working in medical care to um, my mom. And I know that this is some, uh, these are issues that a lot of people in society think about, even though we're not seeing perhaps those mass uh, demonstrations, but it, it voices itself in different ways. Anybody else from the audience? Okay, then uh, then let me uh, close the, the session with a very general and, and may, maybe hopeful question. What is the social change that you would most, what that you're most looking forward to in the next years? What is it that you're working on and that you want to see in society happen? <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> With silence within <laughs> your line of uh, let's say projects and digital tools and your expertise, I mean, there is a goal that you're working yeah, towards too, and maybe you want to share it from that. my side, perhaps to the question, because I would say that on a positive note, uh, we have seen an incre increased awareness for internet freedom issues amongst different areas of politics. Um, we are seeing more people with 
uh, within different parties and within different areas of government, um, becoming aware of these issues, understanding these issues, or at least trying to understand these issues, and that is uh, a positive direction that things are heading in. I myself am on this um, lobby fight uh, in my area of development politics when it comes to um, creating, as we were speaking earlier, um, access in different areas of the world, um, more and more people joining the internet um, in our global society, and, and I try to create awareness for the importance of understanding the consequences of technical development in the sense of internet freedom in development politics. And that is a very, very tedious game. Uh, like just an example, you know, um, um, a couple of years ago, I had people from a big development corporation come at me and say, oh, you know, we've been active in Egypt for 20 years doing um, educational development and this and that, but this whole Facebook thing would something just like skipped us. We didn't get that. Can you explain what happened here? And then you sort of see a danger of people going out there saying, yay, like from a government side, we're going to support all these projects for all activists to join Facebook and, and be active on Facebook. And, and then you try to come in and say, well, wait a minute, that's maybe just one aspect of it, but you want to understand issues about privacy and about data protection if you're going to do that. And it's, like I said, very, very tedious, but slowly I do things, uh, see things moving. So I'm hopeful that we s haven't lost the fight to protect our free internet, not just in Germany, but globally, and, and that more and more people are, are becoming active in that area. Great. Raul? Uh, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to use the internet to reclaim back some kind of definitions, uh, for example, um, on, on, on the topic of people with disabilities and inclusion, because what I experienced in the last years is that uh, mostly non-disabled people are talking about people with disabilities. And that's a big problem. And um, it's like, uh, imagine men talking about women and telling you what is best for women uh, without being a woman. And that, that is so wrong on so many levels too that uh, I want to use the internet, and I think we are on a good way uh, to give people with disabilities the power to raise their voice. We want to help them to, um, uh, um, how to say, to, to self-empower them so that they can fight for their own rights, where maybe we can make some kind of connections and gatherings and um, reclaim back the, the, the f definition of what is inclusion. and not giving it away to teachers um, having fear of too much work or uh, giving it away to parents of non-disabled uh, pupils and children to, to only argue, who are only argue by, by, by fear on something new and different, something they have never seen before, but without any arguments that are relevant. You know what I mean? Only emotions. And that is something we are facing in the internet, and I hope we find a solution in general that we don't argument only on emotions, but on facts. And uh, I mean, all this trolle you, you, you see on the internet and Welt Online and whatever, that are only emotions coming from fear, yeah. but, um, but not by facts. Great, thank you. And I think what we heard thank today you. is basically, as you said, it's uh, it's tedious. It's a lot of work. It's as we said, bit by bit. So everything that we do will further that change. And I think uh, today we had a glimpse into your world, and hopefully, uh, some of us um, found inspiration to look for causes, start our own causes. Uh, there is ways to do that. Um, you can connect with these two. You can connect with other people. There is uh, definitely, I'd say, a, a hopeful perspective despite everything else that we see that is wrong on so many levels. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>welcome to to stay for a drink the bar is open i mean just uh, we'll be we'll hang around for a while and uh, yeah. please come up and talk thank, thank you. you see you next time <laughs>